Hi, I'm Marie Munoz. This is the Why Hoop docu series, and I'm here with Dr. Jay Cummings. It's good to have you, and I want to talk to you a little bit about your basketball career. Okay. So, um, how were you introduced to the game? Well, I was introduced because of uh, by luck. I ended up uh, raised being raised in a, in, a, in a house next door to the rec center, uh, and the recreation center had all kinds of activities. And, I took, a, I took a, a chance and moved into basketball faster than I did the other things. Right. So uh, it became a, a good place for me to learn the game of basketball, as well as the other things that helped me stay in shape, like swimming, softball, tennis, volleyball, all those sort of things. And sometimes just a, a good game of check a pool. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, clean up your mind and start thinking about some other things. Just something to do all day, because that's where I live. Next door is where I live, and, uh, and the house is where I got my meals every day. Were there other um, sports at the rec center that you enjoyed just as much as basketball, or basketball was the passion from the beginning? No, I enjoyed them all. I enjoyed it, uh, because we, we were winners. You know, we used to win the swimming meet, we win the uh, softball, touch football, we didn't have a football team. Right. And uh, basketball, and the guys would come from all over town to play there because you didn't have a center like that in any other place on the west side of Dayton. So the competition was always great. And what do you feel was your skill set at that point or um, some of your best or worst attributes in the beginning? Well, uh, one or two things happened. I learned how to handle the ball. Mm -hmm. I had a real good shot, and I knew how to pass the ball. Because I always played with older guys, so the only time they would let me play was when they didn't have somebody to make a full team, so they let me play. And they tell me, don't miss the shot, because we're playing for money. And, I, <laughs> and we put your 50 cent in, so you know what's going to happen if you miss the shot. And at this point, what, what grade were you in? Uh, I was in, at that time uh, I, that I was doing that, I was in like the uh, eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade, because I was playing with the uh, elementary school team. And who are some of the people that influenced you um, in your basketball career? Fast forwarding a little bit to more mm -hmm. high school, college, um, people like coaches or teammates or relatives. Well, in high school, uh, we had uh, two real good teams in Dayton, Roosevelt and Dunbar. And all those guys worked out at the Linden Center and the YMCA, which was in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I used to go up and watch them play. And then every now and then, they would let me get in. Well, I would see a move or something that they did that I had never tried before. And then the next day, I'd be working on that. Right. And then I got to know them. So it was just guys like uh, uh, Willie Shine, my cousin Chuck Lewis, uh, who were so many of them. They played with different teams, but they all trained together and they played really hard. They were from the same neighborhoods, but they didn't go to the same schools. Dunbar and Roosevelt were the key schools in Dayton at that time for African-American students. And uh, of course, we took our skills with us. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest game in, in town was always uh, the battle between Dunbar and Roosevelt to see who's gonna go on to the tournament or who's gonna win the championship. So um, what are some of the teams that you played against in uh College. The toughest teams that we played were uh, in the Midwest Athletic Association. Uh, the, top, the top team was Tennessee State University mm -hmm. in Nashville. Uh, I, would, I would put uh, a second. A third would be a, a battle between Kentucky State and uh, uh, the school, I'm, I'm blocking the school right now, but the school is uh, uh, in um, Missouri, and so we had to play that team, and that team was um, uh, made up of four team uh, basketball schedule. But we paid more attention to Tennessee State than anybody because they had height and talent from all over the country, and we we were staying. And uh, most of our players were in the Midwest, like Michigan, Ohio, uh, 
Sometimes we get into Illinois, right. and sometimes we go over into Kentucky and get us some players, or most of the other players were around Ohio. And around that time, what uh, what year was this between your that was your college? Let's see. I'd have to say that was. Uh, see, I came out of high school in '59. Mm -hmm. So that puts down there to uh, I'm in uh, uh, the early '50s when I was doing all this stuff, learning the game. Right. And so by the time I got to the freshman, I went, when we won all the championships at the elementary level, Garfield Elementary School in Dayton, Ohio. And we were all of us were supposed to go to Dunbar, but Dunbar was our big rival because we had a seventh and eighth grade team at the high school. Right. And we had a seventh and eighth grade team at the elementary school. And after we beat up on everybody, they had a hard time getting us to come to Dunbar or Roosevelt because they were building their teams based on the seventh and eighth grade. Did you have any memorable rivalries at that time? Yeah. With the high school? Yeah, we had all kinds of rivalries. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I quit the team in the ninth grade. We won the championship. We go to Dunbar. They put the championship team on the bench. And, and, and we, we wasn't getting any we wasn't getting any playing time. So I told them, I said, look, if you're not going to let us play, we already won the tournament and everything. We should all be playing. And right. So anyway, I moved. I said, I'm not going to take this. So I went and played with the church league. And this was ninth grade? This was, this was, nah, this was this was ninth to 12. Okay. So guys who didn't make the team or guys who uh, could have made the team if they had done something in the right way. Right. So you're playing with uh, guys who might be 17, 18, 19, and here you are 11 or 12 playing. Right. But that's why I got a chance to, to hone my game. Who are some of the most memorable players that you played with? The players, I would say, the old guy named Pete Johnson, Norman Lee, uh, Chuck Lewis, uh, Dylan Ham. Oh, these um, in high school, college? These, these guys were, uh, they were, they were in high school. They were seniors okay. and stuff like that. And many of them were getting ready to go to college. Right. And, and, and several of them went. Uh, Dylan Ham and uh, Chuck Lewis went to uh, Knoxville College. And they had a real successful career down there. They turned their program around. And they were one of the few teams that beat Tennessee State. Right. Yeah. But they were, they were great players. They just didn't have a lot of height. Mm -hmm. uh, other guys went to the, they went with the Globetrotters because you could get paid coming out of high school. Did you ever try out for the Globetrotters? No, 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 no. no. I was I was going to school. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I knew that's what was going to last long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, in your basketball career, throughout your career, is there a clutch situation um, on the court that you can describe the way you handled it? If there's, the if, if, if there's a moment when, you know, somebody needs to have the ball, I thought it used to be me because I could pass it, mm -hmm. I could shoot it. I wasn't going to make a mistake. Right. And, uh, but I played with some guys that felt the same way. Right, <laughs> right. So everybody on the team felt that way. <laughs> so uh, there were several occasions when, if it went to one guy, I won't mention his name, mm -hmm. uh, I knew he was going to shoot it, so I was trying to make my way to the basket right. in case he missed and I didn't get the rebound and put it back in, you know. <laughs> So what what a team player or um, uh, rivalry that you had got the best of you or someone that, that you would um, maybe defeated by that you would like to have a, another crack at it if you if you could? Well, if I started at, at the uh, elementary and uh, the high school piece, there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the better ball players were, uh, were with Roosevelt. Matter of fact, they had a real good team. And uh, so guys like uh, Buford Davis, as a matter of fact, they won the championship a year after I graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, ooh, we had a great team. I'm not, I'm not really coming to their names real fast, but uh, Buford Davis, Ray Brown, uh, boy, this boy was really tough too. And I see him, but I can't think of his name. Are there any, um ball players that you played with back then in high school or college that you are still in contact with that you still um, uh, communicate or know of not just from just from my still teammates friends. yeah yeah just a lot of them are passed on you know uh, uh jake and uh, ld and 
few other people played around the neighborhood, but they passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, all I remember more than anything else is that um, in our last year, we were supposed to win the state tournament. And uh, we, got, uh, we got beat by a last second shot. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the end of us being together because we went different ways. Uh, one of the guys, he went to baseball. He was a real great ball, baseball mm -hmm. player. He went into the pros. Some of us went to college for, for track. Some of us went for football. I went for basketball. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, the state tournament. And is there any honors or recognitions that you received throughout your career? Uh, the, the, always got uh, uh, any team I played with over time. I always got the MVP. Every team I played with MVP. And uh, also had uh, uh, a good way of staying in the game, not ever fouling out. So in your opinion, what do you feel it takes to be an MVP? Well, it, it takes a person who really wants to dedicate themselves to the game because basketball is played by a lot of people who don't mm -hmm. have a whole lot of money, but they got a whole lot of skills. And so you got to put yourself together for that. And you got to keep up. Right. Keep up, and uh, the, the major part of uh, of coming to uh, to be a winner is that you believe in yourself, mm -hmm. and you're willing to work hard enough to get to a level that will bring you right into that level of basketball. And you don't get it when you go from high school. There's a major gap to college. Right. This is when everybody stayed in in college. Now you can go out early, and then there was a there's a piece where you had to kind of wait your turn until you got a chance to go into the pros because they didn't have that many teams. And the people that played were astronomical. Uh, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't talked about Oscar Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, call him Big O. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I sit down with a group of people and they would ask me a question, who was the best basketball player you ever saw, you ever knew, and you can validate that he's the best? I still would go with Oscar Robinson. Of all these people that have changed, because the game changed too. Right. And you didn't have uh, you didn't have the best shoes. Uh, you know, you could have you could twist your ankle very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have anybody who was at that point in time who was six he was a six five guard mm -hmm. and weighed about two hundred. So yeah, but he was fast. You know, you couldn't take the ball from him. And he usually in the in the pros when he got there, he usually averaged triple doubles. For the whole year, that means you get doubles in scoring, and rebounding, and assists. No, was he was he on a team that you were on that you played no, with? No, or I he was wasn't on, on a team. team. I would I wouldn't I went for the I went to uh, to the team for a trial. Mm -hmm. It was the Cincinnati Royals at the time, and uh, they told me they said, well, "Now we had some pretty good games and we played." And then at the end, at the end, the coach came over and this is exactly what he told me. He said. Um, I see you got a pretty good game. You like to shoot the ball. I said, yeah, I said, do all right. So now I just got to be uh, level with you. Right. Um, the only spot open on this team is the one that Oscar occupies. So I said, well, <laughs> that doesn't give anybody much of a choice because he's the best player in the whole league. Right. And they had a guy over there uh, from Kentucky named uh, Adam, I think it was Smith, mm -hmm. Adrian Smith. And he was the other guard, a fast guard that could play. He played for Kentucky basketball. I said, now, I get him. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, but that's not open. Right. <laughs> See, the thing was, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have, usually had three black players on the team at the time. And it, it grew over the years to four when the Boston, Boston Celtics had their team. And they had four black guys on the team. They won the national championship by 11 times. Now, around that time, was that something that they arranged on, on purpose? Uh, was that uh, mandatory for them to do, or you well, said it changed over time? So, uh, I, I, to have I, only three black players on the team was that? Yeah, that was a, that was an agreement. But the agreement was, if you had three, the agreement was you don't have them on the floor at the same time, mm. unless it gets down to the end of the game. Somebody got to do something. Then the coach could put them on. Right. Everybody on. They usually won then. Mm -hmm. But uh, it kind of it was it was a crazy time. So most people that played good basketball during that time didn't make the pros. Okay. So it's like if you see a pro team now, you have to find out where's the white guy. Yeah, you know, exactly. They're not there because all these other guys 
that didn't get a chance to play could play too. Right. So they started playing like I did, and I played a little bit overseas uh, in, in Colombia. And I played with teams where we played for a company. Right. And the company would, would give us some money, you know. But it wasn't, it wasn't NBA money, wasn't it? So that kind of goes into my next question. Here uh, in America, um, what were some of the rules that existed at the time that you were playing versus the rules that are, that are set in place now? Well, there, there, were, there were quite a few things. One was, uh, it was quite interesting. At one time, because they had, had so many uh, black basketball players mm -hmm. that could jump real high. Right. And they would start, they started dunking. Mm -hmm. You know what dunking is, right? Right, Boom. right, right. And, so did know, no one had done that before? They had done it, they had on? done it in the games like that. They hadn't done it with such ease. Okay. And you know what, the, 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 board, the board decided to uh, say that was a violation. Oh. So they took the dunking out of the game for a while. And so people were, people in the stands wanted to see the dunks. Right. And after a while, they overcame that. They said, look, if y'all don't have the teams in there that can play and dunk, then we're not going to come see you. And they said it every place. And so they, they opened it back up again. And it is what it is now. Around what year was that? When you, when that this was, was going? I'd have to say that was close to uh, early 60s. Mm hmm Early 60s. And, I mean, you had... Uh, uh, you may not know this, know this name, but Will Chamberlain was 72. We can dunk every any time he got the ball. Mm -hmm. Bill Russell, but then they had to lay the ball up, right? Because that was a, a, a violation until they changed the rule again, and then it became real basketball. So aside from that, were there any uh, social benefits, uh, special interactions um, that involved basketball for you, or meetings that came about for you? Um, well, I think for me, I think I was pretty uh, lucky to have the kind of game that got me to go to college and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. But along the way, it also taught me that, hey, if they only got three people on the team, I better make sure that I graduate. Right. And I might want to look at teams in foreign countries, which is what a lot of those guys do now. Mm -hmm. They didn't have many then. And that gave you a little waiting time. You just wait. One of these days, they're going to let me try out again, and I'm going to be ready because I'm practicing and that sort of thing. And then they started to have uh, more and more industries because the guys were not going into the league, but they were able to go into the industry. They had the job during the day, and they played ball uh, on the side, so they got a, a supplement to their check. Mm -hmm. That's how they ended up using their uh, skills. They had to play for them, but they played against the best, but they just didn't get any money. So usually, you said you went overseas. Usually, what's the reason that uh, basketball players decide to go overseas? Is that a choice, or are they called, or they're chosen yeah, to go play somewhere else? Uh, uh, if, a, if, a team, if a team had good connections with a foreign team, they might say to themselves, that I can't keep with three black guys, but these other three guys can play too. So we're going to see if we can get them to go. We can't, we'll give them a little money and they go and play overseas. They still do that. Yeah. And uh, well, maybe some, if somebody gets hurt, we can bring them back. But, that's, but now it's, uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly brothers. And what, um, I know that... Um, we hadn't talked about if you had any injuries uh, while you were playing basketball, whether in high school or college. You, you had any? Oh, yes, I had injuries. <laughs> I hate to remember them. Uh, yeah, I used to have, I had some ankle trouble, cause, mm -hmm. again, because the shoes were not the kind I had. Uh, I remember I, I kind of fractured my leg uh, when I was working out in town, just playing some playground ball. and. Uh, I shouldn't say it this way, but uh, sometimes the uh, HBCUs don't have the capacity to, to deal with stuff that's very sensitive. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I got back to camp and they took me to the hospital. And the major thing they did was put ice on it. Right. So I'm laying up there for two days. And just so happened, my mother came to see me. And they, they told her, well, he's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. You don't even want to make a big deal of it. She went in the door, she saw my ankle, 
And she said, put him on the, on the, on the table, take him to the car, I'm gonna take him to a real hospital. Okay. <laughs> so he took me to the hospital in Dayton. And they got me straight faster than I would have gotten otherwise. But uh, hopefully all that's changed now because the equipment is not like equipment is today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. What's some of the best advice that you've ever received um, throughout your career and who was that person? The best, advice. Advice, the best advice I had was from a man named uh, Thomas Taylor. Thomas Taylor was, uh, was my uh, advocate. He was also the person that gave me a lot of advice. He, he died uh, about two years ago. He was 105. And he, 105. I met him at 105, yeah. And he always told me three things. He said, I've been watching you. He said, just remember three things if you don't think anything else. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. He said, now, when it comes to money, earn some, mm -hmm. save some, and give some. I said, what you talking about? I'm going to sell it, you know. He said, you're not going to make all the money in the world. Right. So save some of it. Right. Okay. You're going to say, there's going to be people that, that you know that need some. Okay. He's going to help them out a little bit. Yeah. And you might end up with a family. So, you know, we got people that you still got to give them some money. Right. And the, the, the last thing he said was, uh, keep it. Keep some for the rocky day, the cold day. Right. That was his advice. That's been my, uh, and I did hey, all that. that. If you carry that some advice. Of the, although some of the people owe me some money now. <laughs> 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 that, that were, that were in the group, but I, that's kind of where I got it from. It was, so that you was carry the best that, advice I ever got. You carried that throughout your yeah. lifetime. But he also say, taught me how to how to farm, how to farm in the city mm -hmm. and do that kind of stuff. He's a nice man. He was a great man, and he would he would he would never tell you what to do. He would give you options. Right. This is what you might be able to do. So if you had the choice, who would you like to meet face to face, um, in the basketball realm? In the basketball realm, right. oh, I thought you were going another way with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, I know just about everybody except the new guys. Um, Is there anyone new that you like that plays basketball now that that you, you know, admire? Yeah, yeah. I like uh, I like the whole Warriors team almost. Okay. Uh, particularly since they picked up uh, Durant, you know. Uh, but I like uh, San Antonio's has got some good stuff too. But they they got the way he works it, it makes it uh, very difficult to beat them. Uh, so there are quite a few now. When you look at uh, all of the players now who have like gone through an uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, initiation at the high school, and then some of them went to college for a very short time, and some of them went on into the pros. So you know any any team that's coming in. They usually got one or two guys that you just want to see. Right. And then the other people sitting over on the bench who can play just as well, they waiting on somebody to get hurt. And uh, so it's, it's that kind of a game. Uh, but they all can play. I never I never saw anybody in the in the late years of the NBA who couldn't play. Mm -hmm. Now some of them didn't get to play because they weren't they didn't fit whatever they were trying to do. Were there any that you felt were really good that, that really didn't, didn't get to get play played? that much? They were underestimated. No, I can say it that way. The, the, the way I would have to say it is that two of my guys got caught up in, a, in what they call a, uh, a betting scheme. They were young guys out of New York. Connie mm -hmm. Hawkins was one of them, 6'8", could do anything with the ball. Another was Roger Brown, 6'5", he was from Boys High. Mm -hmm. And we always play, I played against all of them. They were, they were like, they would have been like the people that you know now uh, that are really good. Mm -hmm. They were good then. But they, they got caught up in this betting scheme. Outside of basketball. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and the people that bet on them and on their team, when they, when they busted that open, they, they, they wouldn't let them into the NBA until they got old. They let them play in the NBA about six years after they were in their prime. Mm -hmm. And they still played pretty good, but they right. were like outstanding. But they were no longer in their prime. But in your basketball career, what was your goal, your ultimate goal in the sport? Uh, my, at first, my, my goal was uh, to, to, to be a pro, to be, to be a shooting guard at 6'3". 
Okay. okay. And uh, I tried I tried out at two or three teams. And the last time I tried out was with the Bullets. And we were we were practicing in Baltimore. And the first the, the first scrimmage we had, I twisted my ankle. Mm -hmm. okay. Again, those were those shoes. So they gave me another set. I put these on. I went out and I hurt my other ankle because I was favoring it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, they called in five of us, and they gave us a check. They got there, they gave me $4,000 for that week I spent there. That's mm -hmm. Gus Johnson and uh, a lot of good guys. And this was the third time for me. And I said- when, and Was that here or overseas? No, it was there. I was coming out of the, uh, the, the, the uh, Baltimore arena on crutches. Nobody was helping me. I had two big bags. And I said, that's it. I'm never gonna do this again. These dudes didn't even take me. They gave me a four thousand dollar check. They wouldn't. Even, they didn't even take me to the cab. I'm out there with, you know, trying to get to. The, I got on the plane. I said, no, I'm going, I'm going on back to school. Did you feel like that was the mm -hmm. it, right, pretty much the end of your career? Grades. I said, I'm going on back to school. Yeah, but I ain't gonna quit playing basketball. I'm just mm -hmm. not trying to make the pros anymore. And that's what. And then I got a chance to travel around and do stuff. But, and you um, played the the game of basketball. How do you feel basketball has played for you? What do you think it's, it's done for you? It, well, I think maybe it's it's the most exciting piece of sports that I like. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, I just uh, if I if I hadn't been, if I wasn't so old now, I'd probably still be shooting my jump shot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that really was um, kind of to wrap up a little bit. Um, uh, is there any other reason why you feel you would play um, basketball other than just the sport? Well, to be to be real honest, with you, uh, in in the neighborhood that I was in, you had to you had to do something extraordinary. Or see, I don't have I didn't have any brothers, mm -hmm. and I never lived with my father. But mm -hmm. I lived in the, the roughest neighborhood in Dayton. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. I can deal with anybody who's my size and my age, but if everybody else got three, four brothers. So if you leave and take care of the one that's your, your size, your age, you think it's, oh, it's not over. It's not over until they beat you down. Mm -hmm. You go to the next brother, the next brother, the next brother. So I said, you know, I, gotta, I didn't use this term then, but I said, I got to be a diplomat. And what is a diplomat for? I'm a diplomat for the community. So when people, we have games and stuff like that, they know I'm on the team. Right. The guys around, I said, man, don't mess with those tummies, man. You're going to play tomorrow. You know, you're going to catch in baseball. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to do all this. Don't mess with him. Don't mess with him. And the other thing that was important, I had some very nice looking aunts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which, what did that yeah, mean for and, you? And, and, and my grandmother was running, was in charge mm -hmm. of the Linda Center next door. Cause she did. She was. They didn't have to hire anybody to watch stuff. She watched anyway. Oh, okay. So that really was. A, a, it was kind of a blessing. Right. To live in. Yeah. 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 So, Dr. Cummings, um, since you didn't go to the NBA, was do you had any other options um, as far as still continuing to play basketball? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I did, and and that was uh, that was the thing that that drew me back uh, to the academy. I had an undergraduate degree, and I was had worked in schools, uh, trying to get to the next level. And I so happened to be in a school that was uh, uh, in a pretty rough neighborhood. But uh, I'm from a pretty rough neighborhood, so I, I ended up getting a Ford Fellowship to go on and get my doctorate. While I had gone, when I was in that school, I was going for my master's at another school. I just wanted to do that, and. Uh, it's what happens when you when you, you learn how to put things together. I remember now, I didn't pay to go to college because I played basketball. Didn't make the pros, but I didn't pay to go to a master's program and a doctorate program that were paid for for me, full scholarship, everything. And uh, you had a chance to do other things that were quite important. Well, the Ford Fellowship is, is a, a big thing, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I, I had, I made, I made more money going to school than I made working right. at a school. 
because I didn't have to worry about a lot of things. They, they, they fed me, they, they housed me, and they gave me money that I didn't have to spend. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a different approach to staying in basketball. Because when I went to Columbia, the money that took care of me in Columbia was matched by the people there. So I had a pretty substantial little stash. Right. But I, I didn't stay long because there was a lot of problems there with uh, uh, drugs. And uh, you had to be real careful. But uh, a good friend of mine, who also is a black Colombian named Dr. Raul Cuero, mm -hmm. was the one that enticed me to go over there. Right. right. And I was going to ask you that if you had if you had been to any interesting places. Yeah, we both had met at the university. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he was doing work uh, in uh, uh, the university on the doctoral program, and I was finishing up my. I was in the uh, College of Education, and he was in. Uh, uh, microbiology and plant pathology and that sort of thing. He's probably making much more than me now because he goes all over the world and he gets paid for it. And I stay right here and get paid a little bit. So while, while you were overseas, do you have any, any um, interesting stories that, um, from your basketball career over there? No, I, I, I didn't. From the places that you've gone? I, I didn't. I've, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time doing work for the uh, United States uh, Information Agency. Mm -hmm. Be right before uh, uh, Nelson Mandela was free, I was uh, selected as a person to go over and visit all of the major cities to see if we couldn't get more of the Africans who were in the uh, revolution, we didn't go to school, how to get them back into school. Oh. And uh, I spent time in uh, Colombia doing that. And uh, the key was, actually the key was what we were doing here in Texas, uh, the migrant workers. When the migrant workers would leave Texas and go north, we would send a package piece with each one of them so they could keep with their uh, grades and everything. Mm -hmm. That's the same piece that we put together in uh, Colombia. The Africans who lived there, who didn't live in town, uh, had uh, distances they had to deal with. So they would move around. And this, this, this package that we had was what they were able to use to keep everybody up there and bring the, 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 the students who had been revolutionaries, bring them back into school so they could finish. That was So big, when, that was um, when you came back to the States, how was, um, did you continue basketball? How was your career after playing overseas? Oh, I, then I just played at the gym, the regular gym. Talk a little smack. You know, so you were no longer uh, yeah, playing basketball? Yeah, I just go over there. That's how I work out, you know, I, right. up until the, uh, until the time that I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> right, right. So Dr. Cummings, it's been an awesome interview. Um, we appreciate you doing the Why I Hope documentary, and we're glad to have you. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, when you go back in that, the name that they got you going when you come up was Sweet George Brown. That was the Glow Trotters, you know. And you see him throwing the ball around, that sort of thing. And then you would feel like, okay, so that's during the before the game. Then there's a there's a piece after the game where you go to the party when you win. And you can't, you know, you can't be standing alone on the wall just because you made 20 points. You gotta make some moves. And if you make your moves, then you know, you know, number one. They don't do too many slow drags anymore. We give the slow, two slow drags and one fast. So did two they? Two slow, two <laughs> and one. And now if you're gonna mess with, if you put two fast on there, we're gonna be a little angry right. because we done, we've already earned a little recognition right. in the neighborhood, and you get a chance to dance, slow dance with. The, the, the young lady that liked you, but she didn't let anybody know it. Was this until, during the game or after and, the game? Or? Oh, after the game, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. some parties. We, we won a lot. Okay. We had parties, but uh, I can't really speak on all of them because uh, I didn't get a chance to go to all of the games, oh, okay. all of the dances and stuff, because I had girlfriends. Because you had girlfriends? Yeah, I had girlfriends. Yeah, so we didn't always go to the ass? dance. <laughs> We went, we went so to have, have a little privacy. You yeah. <laughs> oh, the music. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we had, uh, we had really those, uh, it was kind of, uh, let's see, I was just listening to something the other day. 
Well, where uh, you got uh, people who are singing romantic songs, mm -hmm. okay, and then they have uh, have the music. I'm thinking in terms of uh, Temptations, okay. I'm, I can go back farther than that. Uh, I'm also Smokey, you know, and uh, who was the singer? Uh, Aretha could put something out there for you. Aretha Franklin. Uh, everybody at Motown could put something out there for you. Did you ever run across uh, any celebrities or people that were yeah. movie stars and singers? And that were yeah, I met a, met a few in, in my time, you know, just uh, from, uh, and I met a lot of them uh, who were um, I mean, jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. I, was, I used to do a lot of work with the uh, uh, radio station here, and I was on the board. And so when we'd have things like that, every year they have uh, like an annual award ceremony, and uh, the, uh, people would come from all over the world. They would like, go to New York or go to Long Beach. That was really pleasant. You know, I got a chance to represent and see people. I was trying to catch up with uh, with Nancy Wilson. Nancy Wilson, you may not know who she is, a great singer. Mm -hmm. And she went to Central State, uh, where I went to school, and she's from Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, uh, I was trying to get to her, because a lot of people, I wanted to take a picture with her. So when I got over there, I said, Sure, it's nice to see you, Miss Wilson. She said, who are you? I said, you know, Cummins. I think we have something in common. We went to Central State, and uh, I think you were a Kappa sweetheart. You know, I done stepped up. She said, no, well, wait a minute, now, wait a minute. I am not a Kappa sweetheart. I married one, but, my, but, uh, but the, I was a Q sweetheart. It's kind of bust my bubble on that one, you know. I said, well. <laughs> I'm going to keep it the way I thought it was. That's what we said it was. We said you were a Kappa sweetheart. So I'm going with that. And she just smiled. That was nice. <laughs> so is there any knowledge or personal experiences through the game of basketball that you've been able to pass on to your children? Well, I think uh, while well, 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 basketball was, was quite uh, happy for me at certain times, I knew that uh, there could come a time when I didn't run as fast and jump as I did shoot as well. So I started to make uh, some plans for that when I got hurt a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I kind of bring myself back to uh, a level of uh, physicality. I could have gone on and played some more, but I started to do some other things. And uh, of course, one of them was uh, this whole notion that took the advantage of. Uh, league that we had when we were here Columbia. We were look, we actually were in Medellin when this happened. But we had played a game and the game was uh, getting away from us. Uh, I still think I'm a coach. I wouldn't think I was suddenly wrong and I I don't I don't speak Spanish that well. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Cuervo, old Cuervo, was the guy who went with me. He's from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I pulled him over to the side, take time out. So we took time out and I said, we got to do something different. And I started putting him in different places, you know. And this is what you do. And then we swing up on the plays. Anyway, make a long story short, we call it one by 25 points. Mm -hmm. That's on that kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. And so some people in the uh, basketball arena that day, were enjoying this kind of a game, and, and uh, uh, Calvin was winning it. Mm -hmm. And so we got the word that we were invited to a party. Mm -hmm. I said, to a party? Let's go. Mm -hmm. know, Raul is from Buena Ventura. Right. And he's, you know, he's, a, he's a learned man. He said, now I got to be real careful. I said, well, then you're going to have to keep me careful. Cause gonna, I got to go and see what's going on. Make a long story short, we went to a little party that, that Pablo was having. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, they treated us well because the obviously they wanted some money. We, we came back. Yeah, once. And they, they were. And, uh, so when you say Pablo, we're talking about Pablo Escobar. Uh, I'll just say Pablo. Oh, just Pablo? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, that's the thing he was I mean, real nice to us. The thing that I remember and I always tell people is that uh, people don't deal, they don't deal with the, they don't deal with, uh, uh, crack and that kind of stuff over there, because there, there was there was a, 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 a 
from mm -hmm. that brought a lot of money into the area. The drunk and I had a group called, a drink called Corey mm -hmm. That's what I drink, Corey Entry. And so we, we had to find a place that was extravagant. I don't know if it was his home there or somebody lived there, mm -hmm. or in the bed. And then uh, my Dr. Ware was there. Jay, let's go. <laughs> I said, let's go, we just get started. He mm -hmm. said, it's time to go. <laughs> he said, I take my word. Was there a reason why he wanted yeah. to leave? Or? Yeah, well, I don't know. He just he just wasn't comfortable. Right. Yeah, I know Everybody knows him, too. Because he was a scientist, too. He, 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 he played ball. Anyway, we left. And we started talking. I said, why would you leave? We had, we had an idea we were going to try to open up a leather, a leather factory. Mm -hmm. That's when people were getting ready to buy all these other things that we have now. And I said, maybe we can get into something that give us a good investment. And he said, well, maybe, but no, 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 don't talk about it tonight. Well, I said, I ain't talking about it anyway. I can tell you what to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, never, it never came to pass. Uh, but on the other side of it is uh, uh, what my grandmother taught me. Mm -hmm. And when that was that was fostered to a great extent with what I said about Mr. Taylor. Right. So they don't need to know how much money I have for them. They need to know how much money I have. Mm -hmm. And then I have to define, decide who gets what when and why. Mm -hmm. And I'm still on that track trying to say who gets <laughs> what when and why. But as far as your children go. be a little something there for everybody. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been, I've been uh, uh, kind of frugal mm -hmm. and uh, taking your, your little uh, uh, livelihood from uh, education. Not going to give you a whole lot of money, but it gives you a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, of, some of my, uh, my six kids will uh, know what to do with it. And some of them have a big party. Right. <laughs> and be all it is, they could be their choice. 